on the right right top hand side um, here the information icon you will see there are three pinned uh, informations in this uh, channel uh, the first one is the link to the slides yesterday and also the hands-on notes um, for today's hands-on sessions so if you don't know where to find the link just click on the information button on the upper right hand corner and then you can find the information in the ping in ping the messages here on your slack channels and also um, there's a cheat sheet for if you still have trouble to set up your jupyter notebook um, just just try to follow carefully on this um, on these commands if you still have problem on opening jupyter notebook inside the docker especially um, just uh, make sure that you have this option in the commands uh, when, when whether you are doing in the linux or mac so please make sure you have this minus p uh, for a a a a a column a a a there so this set up the correct port uh, for you to actually open the jupyter notebook in your browser so if you don't have that option you will not so you will all you are going to trouble to open that in your browser so please check that uh, when you create uh, or you enter docker container you have this command this option in in the in the in the commands so that you can set this up so this cheat sheet also is in the in the paint uh, channel so you can find them here if you have trouble in the middle so now let me switch to my uh, to my browser where the notes are so you should open your uh, hands-on notes uh, following the session there yeah. so the ping ping the notes is on your upper left corner click on the information button here and then you will find that pin item here and then let me switch to the to the to the notes So you should see my browser, is that correct? Sorry. Yes, we can see it. <laughs> okay, um, so, okay, uh, yeah. Remove this, yeah. So, um, so as, as we, uh, this is the, this is the handout session readme file, it should be open, follow the link, you will, you will see this in the web page. So, so let me just uh, first just uh, just brief mention the goal for this hands-on session. So we would like to get familiar how to actually add a hydrodynamic module inside JSK framework. And then we would like to use a realistic hydrodynamic modules, for example, music, trying to actually simulate hydrodynamic simulations with uh, different types of settings. For example, we want to change the collision, um, collision systems such as gold, gold, collision, the rig, or lead collision and LHC. You can even do different types of collisions, such as xenon, xenons, or P gold, uh, if you are interested in, uh, by just changing the parameter set uh, in, the, in, the, in the XML file. We also would like to understand the role of viscosities in terms of modifying the hydrodynamic evolutions in terms of how the temperature and the flow velocity develop with different choice of viscosities, say different value of shear viscosities and bulk viscosities. How do, how do they do that? How do, do they influence the hydrodynamic evolutions? So physics background was mainly that uh, just tell you that Jetscape has actually embraced uh, state-of-art um, kind of uh, models for different stages. We use a Trento parameterization model for the initial state to parameterize event by event initial energy density profiles and then can be passed to a hydrodynamic module, which you will use today will be called music. And inside JSCAP, there's also CLVisc, which is also a GPU powered hydrodynamic module, which can be do more efficient parallelizations in the hydrodynamic simulations. So optionally, we can also include some pre equilibrium dynamics in between the hydrodynamics and the initial state, which describe the pre equilibrium simulations of of the energy density in heavy ion collisions. And right now there's a free streaming modules which actually used to approximate these uh, pre-equilibrium dynamics and give us some non-zero initial velocities. 
And this, we will don't do that in the hands-on session because of uh, there's already quite a bit of other module you need to deal with. Uh, to trying to simplify the uh, exercise, we basically don't touch that in this uh, hands-on session, but you can read, you're very welcome to read our, uh, our framework paper, which tell us, tell you how to actually set this up. And then in the late stage, we'll do the fluid cell will convert to particles through Cooper fire particleizations and then feed it, feed it into uh, hydronic cascade like SMASH. So the SMASH session will be covered by Dima Olichenko's in the next hands-on session. So, so of course, yeah, so here's some notes about uh, set up the Docker. So you, sh you should be right now be familiar with how to actually go enter, enter into a Docker containers or set up a new Docker container through the command line. So here just uh, here just uh, the, the commands you can use to, to actually set up your dockers and just to make sure that you have this option here uh, in this session. So if you want to create a docker with Jupyter notebook support, please make sure you have this uh, in, in your command in there. So uh, I trust most of you have actually done uh, to compile Jscape with uh, the external package, especially the music and ISS, which is required in this session. So that this is the Tuesday's homework uh, for you. So if you still have troubles compile music or ISS with Jscape, or you still see warning that the music module is not installed, et cetera, in the, in the output message from your screen, please follow this session. Um, it will actually explain in details how you can actually set up the module uh, in the correct way. So yesterday we actually go through a quick run about the test run with uh, Jetscape using music. Basically we don't change any uh, much of the in initial parameters inside the XML file. We only just specify the freeze out temperature to be about 150 to in order to, for the whole, or the whole package to run. So this is the minimum kind of setup you can use uh, to actually run Jetscape with the music. And uh, I think lots of you have actually successfully run this uh, through the Jetscape framework through the Docker container. And then we spent a little bit of time on the setting up the Jupyter Notebook yesterday. And today, uh, hopefully, uh, a lot of your question has been resolved during the, during the break of 24 hour breaks. So you actually most, I hope most of you actually figure out how to actually open the Jupyter Notebook uh, inside your Docker container. And this will help us to do a lot uh, easier in the visualization stage. So even if you don't have the Docker container set up, uh, if you tried a lot of things and still cannot resolve it. Uh, so in this session, at least we have provide you Python script to actually help you to um, to actually uh, run this, uh, generate these plots uh, for your visualizations inside these uh, hydro sessions. So if you cannot make Jupyter Notebook work on your laptop, please follow the instruction here, uh, which will help you to actually um, go generate the same plots and animations using just the Python scripts. Uh, the, the extra complication that you need to go to the hydro sessions from your build folder and remember to call, go back once you want to do some additional simulations after you make the plots. So um, let me just recap on the first, uh, on the first uh, te uh, test runs uh, for the first uh, 10 minutes in the following 10 minutes. So first, uh, basically, uh, we would like to basically generate uh, first some test run runs for our visualizations. So we will basically use these two codes um, to, to basically uh, generate them. Um, so if you can follow me, um, if you generate already generated them yesterday, um, you, you already should have the files in the in your build folder. Uh, if you run some additional runs, uh, if you like being quick and going to the following sessions uh, to run additional runs, um, so please just run this command again um, to basically generate the, the test run files for us. So if you run the additional runs, this uh, the pre-generated file will be overwritten. So, so just, uh, just, um, just regenerate them right now. So I will generate on my laptop as an example. So you can actually follow me uh, if you can. Um, and then we will just discuss about the Jupyter Notebook visualizations uh, in a minute once this is generated. So in the beautiful, I'm right now, uh, you should see seeing my uh, terminals. So, so, so I'm right now at the 
just get build folders inside the Docker container. So I need to, I will do is basically I will copy paste this command mm, to the to the command line and then hit the enter to run it. So you will see basically a time evolution messages from the music output uh, with the characteristic emojis uh, from the right hand left hand side telling you that you are running music. And it will finish about at a 7.3 Fermi um, to end the exit. So depend on your machines, it will take a different amount of time, but roughly it will take about uh, a few minutes, uh, three, three, four min three or four minutes if you were on a single core if you are running on multiple cores, you will, you, you will take it will take less time on that. So after running this, you if you do a list on your folders, you will see, uh, just make sure you have three different files that is uh, important for uh, illustration and visualizations. One is called the moment anisotropy uh, ADA, this file, and then there's a, another file called eccentricity, uh, so these eccentricity files, and then also the evolution for movie uh, X, e dot y, X, Y, A, dot music dot that. So let, let me pause here for a minute uh, in case you haven't finished the simulation, um, just, uh, just, to, just to make sure everybody is on the same page before we move on to the next step. Okay. Um, do you want to ask a poll uh, to see? No, if, I think uh, I think this is uh, this is already most of you should be done this step yesterday, so it should be straightforward. So we'll not do a poll to to complicate things for here. Um, but let me just go through the test run, and then we'll do a, um, the 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 real run today for the for the changing collision systems, and we'll do the poll here okay. for now. Mm -hmm. Um, then, uh, so once you finish this, we can actually um, uh, start the Jupyter Notebook. So let me switch back to the, to the Chrome again uh, to, to, to look at the notes. So what you want to look at is uh, start with this visualization with Jupyter Notebook. So make sure you're actually in the build folder, which you should be if you don't do any uh, jump to any other folders right now. So then basically you want to enter these two commands into your browsers, um, so sorry, into, into your command, into your command line. Um, so let me switch back. So I want to enter these two commands. So first is Jupyter Notebook on this thing, and then I want to cat notebook uh, the lock to get actually the link. So so for me, I can basically, by my, my terminal to recognize the link, so I can basically uh, hit on, uh, uh, Press on Control and hit on this link to open a this link in the in the in the in the Chrome. Um, if you if your terminal doesn't recognize it, you can basically just uh, select on this uh, on this uh, guy on this uh, on this address and then just copy paste it on your into your browser. So now let me switch back to the Chrome to, to show you whether how the once the Jupyter uh, notebook is open, you will see this uh, this kind of web page uh, where where you have a Jupyter uh, on the top left and top left corner. And today we're main, mainly interested in just going to the hydro sessions. So you click on the hydro sessions, and then we will 
first for the test runs, we'll use the notebook uh, in terms of these hydro evolve test run and also hydro movie test run. So that's for our test run. Mm -hmm. So if we first click on the uh, evolve uh, hydro evolve test runs, you will go into this notebook. And then what you want to do is basically execute um, this uh, cell by cell using shift plus enter to execute different cells here. So the first cell is basically set up the plus style and the environment variables for us. So basically if you hit the shift enters, it will just, um, without outputting any messages, uh, just set up the background, in, uh, set up the settings in the background. So here are some explanations uh, what you need to do. So here, if you if you follow the instructions, you don't have to do anything here. It just follow the follow the what is written here and just execute. So on the cell six here, so what we are doing here is basically loading the output files from the music evolutions into this Jupyter notebook uh, and call them data one and ECC data one. So first, we'd like to out output is understand the evolution of the temperature which is uh, defined in the way that you can see here. So uh, let me make this thing a bit larger. Maybe for you. So, so, so you can see that I have some notes on how actually we were calculating the average temperature. Here, basically I used energy density as a weight uh, to actually wait for the temperature uh, over the transverse plane. So if you want to plot the temperature, you can actually uh, just execute the cell seven here down below. And you can you will see is basically a temperature evolutions from about 240 at the initial time around one Fermi or 0.5 Fermi, and it's actually just decrease uh, to a lower temperature about uh, 0 0.12 GeV at the at the last time. So this gives you the hydrodynamic evolutions about the, the average temperature of your of your fireball at a given proper time, and you can see how it evolves. So right now it's only one curve. So you just see this decreasing as, as the hydrodynamic medium expands and the cools in the transverse plane. Um, so, so in the later uh, exercise, we'll actually compare two different sets of hydro runs. So, so you will see two curves, which actually have different behavior. So you may, that actually help us to learn some physics in, in these hydrodynamic simulations. Then you can move on to actually do, do later one. Actually, is uh, the next one is actually look at the evolution of the average velocities. So if you hit on enter on this cell eight, uh, you can actually help uh, what, what is actually plot is actually the average flow velocity as a function of evolution time. So as you can see that uh, we start with zero velocities at the initial time when you have only energy density at 0.5 Fermi. And then actually during the hydrodynamic simulations, uh, the, the pressure gradient is, is converted into flow velocity. And you can see the average flow velocities has actually increased as a function of the proper time as you go to later time. And then eventually you can see that at the, at the time when everything is freeze out, it's about, about, 0 .6, uh, uh, about 0 0.6 of the speed of light uh, in, the, in the transverse plane. So it's quite relativistic in this, in this sense. Then other quantities you can look at is, is the evolution of the spatial eccentricities, which tell you how eccentric the fireball looks like uh, evolve as a function of time. So here we actually look at the second order eccentricity where we set n equals to two. So if we hit enter on this one, you can actually see the spatial eccentricity or ellipticities uh, as a function of the evolution time. So initially we start at the initial time, which has a really large uh, eccentricities because the simulation we run is uh, 50 to 60% uh, lead, lead collisions at the LC energy. So you will actually have a large eccentricities at the initial time. Uh, basically the, the overlapping areas are very elliptic. And then as a function of time, you can see that the ellipticities actually decrease the function of time which means that you get a large expansion rate around the, around, around the, around the, around the short axis of the elliptic, elliptics and the, the whole shape of the fireball become round and rounder again. So uh, as, as this epsilon goes to zero, the fireball will be totally round. So you can see that it actually decreases as a function of hydrodynamic, as hydrodynamics evolves. Chun? And change the um, shape of the, yeah. Yeah, sorry to but so, so I just want to mm -hmm. for the participants. There seem to be a couple of technical issues with uh, launching the the Jupyter notebook. 
And I just want to tell uh, mm -hmm. them that if you want to step into the breakout room uh, and, and talk with Chuck um, and see if they can resolve, and you can actually talk to somebody rather than you know just slacking back and forth, just raise your hand and you know, click the blue raise hand button on Zoom and I will assign you to the breakout room where you can get some more technical support. Just, just letting everybody know. Sorry to interrupt yours. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So also, um, those uh, if if you cannot really work on on the Jupyter notebook, you can run the Python script, and then you will have the full PDF output for all these four plots. So just easy for me to explain that in the in the Jupyter notebook. But even if you just run the Python scripts, you will have all these four plots output. So you will also you can see the evolution from there. So the last but not least, we can also look at the momentum and isotropies, which is a measure from the hydrodynamic side to measure how elliptic flow can develop as a function of time. So the definition of epsilon p is actually written in this way, which is the difference between the different the xx component of the energy momentum tensor minus the yy component of the energy momentum tensors. So if you want, if if you if now we plot the the epsilon p as a function of time, you can see that it has these structures. So it starts with zero because in initial time, we only have energy densities. We don't have any momentum and isotropy in the system. Um, you see these kind of bump structures uh, in the in the curve, and this is because we are plotting the magnitude of epsilon p, which is always uh, stay positive, the square root of something. So. In, in reality, you, you can imagine this should be negative and they actually smoothly cross over and then kind of connect to that uh, if we plot with a, with the correct sign of this epsilon p in there with the correct phase. So you will see a just a go negative first and actually go, go increase to be positive in this event because I think the go, go negative is because the event by event fluctuation in the initial state so that it doesn't guarantee that it's always just keep increasing. But you see that after two Fermi, uh, later on, the, the overall geometry actually sets in actually help you to increase the, the epsilon p in the in the in the in the in the correct directions. Let's say, and then you can see that this actually increased to about 0.12 in the later time. So this means that during the hydrodynamic evolutions, the fireball, uh, the hydrodynamics keep generating the moment and isotropy, which will actually in final state imprint into the the elliptic flow v2 of the particles. And this can be correlated also with the evolution of eccentricity so that uh, the shape of the fireballs become rounder and rounder, but the, the, in the momentum space of flow velocities actually become more elliptics uh, in, the, in, the, in the evolutions. So from these two plots, you can have a better idea on, the, on, on how the elliptic flow is developed during the hydrodynamic simulations. So if we have gone through this, now we can actually now go to the second step, which is actually looking at the movies, which is actually more fun than the actually uh, the, the one dimension plot. You can also, uh, if you cannot open this Jupyter notebook, you can also use the, uh, you can also use the, um, the, the, Python, the, the Python scripts, which is, um, which is this uh, hydro movie test run by PY to generate the same movie and also contour plots that I will discuss in this uh, Jupyter notebook. So again, if you first enter these test runs, you first just go through the Jupyter notebook and you can just hit uh, shift enter to execute all the cells one by one. And then as you can see that, uh, uh, so in order to, we, we have a cell, big cell to actually reading the movie files. You basically hit enter, basically at the end of the cells will tell you that the reading data is complete, how many frame of the tower is actually reading. And then there are some grid informations, how large is the resolutions actually we run for these simulations. And this gives you some information about the, the history file that we read in. So, so one thing we can do with this uh, evolution file is we can look at the contour plot of say temperature distribution in the transverse plane, which is explained in this plot. So if you hit execute on these uh, cells, you will actually see the, the color contour plot of your temperature profile of, of the collisions actually in the, in the transverse plane. So this is give you a bigger, uh, a clear picture what kind of density profile you are looking uh, simulate with hydrodynamics. 
and this is at tau equals uh, 0.5 at the initial tau. You can also plot as a function of tau uh, in terms of the, how the temperature profile evolve, and this is in this uh, in this cell, and this is a second uh, is a two-dimensional plot of the temperature distributions at a function of x and tau. Uh, in the in the two dimensions, and you can see that at the initial time it's very hot in the middle, and actually just how the temperature evolves as a function of time, and um, towards the later time. And the more interestingly, you can actually plot the the animations of the temperature profile by generating a movie. So I would recommend you to comment on the last line here to save into MP4. Otherwise, you you will see a black uh, you will see a blank thing for a while, and then the movie will open after the whole. Uh, file is generated. So if you come out that line, you will lively see how the uh, profile is actually evolving in terms of inside this Jupyter notebook. And you can actually see how the, the file evolves as a function of time in here. And if you li really like these movies, you can just uncomment out this line and then just it will save into uh, MP4 files. And you can even uh, specify how fast you want to have this, uh, to have these uh, slides in, in, in kind of uh, to evolve uh, in here. So here is the an animations of the temperature profile. Uh, uh, more fancy thing is actually also to impose the flow velocities on there. So also just first comment out the last line in the cells in the next one for this generating temperature and flow velocity field. So if you hit on and execute these cells, you can see that this is an illustration that you have a background, which is the temperature contours, and then you have some arrows, which actually integrate in, in indicates where the radio flow is. So here I use a relative low 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 resolutions to speed up the simulation. I will otherwise it take a while to execute it uh, to for final resolutions. But if you want the final resolution, you can uh, change this uh, skip uh, from two to one and to basically see a um, finer resolution animations here. If I change here from two to one, uh, you will see that uh, the resolution much is finer. So you actually didn't skip the file. So you get more arrows and give you more information about how the velocity field of the fluid uh, look like in the transverse planes. But this takes some more, a little bit more computing times uh, because it's lively actually uh, uh, de de demonstrated in this notebook. Uh, but you can also just uh, uh, save it uh, if once you actually are happy with the animations. So this is a quick walkthrough about the, the two Jupyter notebooks that we will work on. That for the for the rest, uh, for the rest of the task, we also we're using the same. Fo we'll follow the same um, kind of uh, procedures to generate some events on the, in the command line, and then there's corresponding uh, Jupyter notebook and the Python script to help you to actually visualize the comparison between one and the other. So let me stop here, maybe for a few minutes to 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 take questions and also. Uh, other things in there. If there are some common questions I can answer instead of uh, giving TA more work. So yeah, so I see there, there's a, the latest one, there's a error about JS Hydro um, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the command. This is probably because you are using a low, uh, uh, older version of the of the scripts. Please uh, update your scripts, uh, which is uh, which needs to be. Uh, I think the script was latest update during Sunday. So if you haven't updated the, the, the summer school scripts, uh, you need to update that so that 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 will fix your problem. So I saw an error about the notebook, the X is not defined. Uh, I think this is because you don't run, you haven't run all the cells one by one. You need to run them from the top one by one to there and so that every all the pointers are defined there. Where does animation save? So it's saved at the same uh, hydro session folders. So so if uh, so once you 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 actually uncomment the um, the if you uncomment the the command here, uh, it will save the animations in the hydro session folder. 
So you'll find the MP4 file there. Jun, do you want to do a poll now? Uh, sure, yes. If you have succeed to do this, you can indicate yes in the poll. So, so far we have 48 yeses and two noes, 49 yeses, and it's rising, the yeses are rising. Um, there is a question, uh, could you say one more time how to increase the resolution of the animation? Oh, sorry. Um, so if you go to the last cell, there's an unskip in the first line. Um, so change it to one. And so that you will have increased the resolution of the animations. So uh, default was two to actually help you to actually quickly visually see how the anim animation goes. But if you have a longer time, you can actually ch change it to one so that it take a while to generate the movie, but actually it looks better. Since we're pausing and waiting people to catch up, I'll ask another question from the thread randomly. Mm -hmm. In the latter animation, the matter cools down and the velocity vectors grow, but it cannot be seen that the matter is spreading out in the figure. Why is that? Mike, can you speak louder? Oh, we can, we yes, can. yes. Uh, um, so, so, yeah. so the reason is that I only showed the, the, the contour above some threshold of temperatures. So here the threshold is about 130 MeV. So you can see that uh, mostly at the later time, the fiber is shrinking because uh, a lot of matter stuff is go outside, it goes below 130. And I didn't output um, the flu cell up below that temperature because uh, in these simulations, we usually switch uh, to hydronic cascade at 150 MeV. So 130 is already an overkill um, to basically illustrate where the matter is. So eventually once, once the fiber shrinks, uh, those will be actually hydronized. Those flu cells will be hydronized to particles, and then, sorry, and those 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 particles will, will actually hydronize to particles, and then they will just feed into hydronic cascade. So you actually see a shrinking fireball instead of expanding. So we are now at 60 yeses and three noes. Mm -hmm. So I would say half of the class has definitely managed to mm -hmm. catch up. Uh, and, so and we, can, we can maybe just, yeah, if you haven't catch up, you can still try. Um, and also we can try, uh, I think we should go, go forward to the next uh, exercise. Okay, so I'm deleting this poll, okay? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, I forgot which thing I'm sharing. So did you see my, I think you still see my browser, right? Yes, I think we're looking at your browser. Okay. On the okay, summer okay. school 2020 tab. Okay, good. okay, okay, yes. So now we go to the Super Saiyan, which means that we want to change a little bit more uh, on, the, on the input files. So you need a little bit more, more, more knowledge. So, so what we want to do is we actually want to use JSCape to simulate different collision systems. Like we want to change collision energies, collision types of nuclei, and also centrality. So we want to simulate the, 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 the most interesting uh, collisions you, you are interested in. Then, then the, the, the procedure to do that is basically actually to modify the trend of parameters in the file. So if you, um, so example, you can actually uh, open uh, the XML files, uh, for example, in the hydro session. So the hydro session jet user, Jetscape user, GoGo200, where this will actually simulate a GoGo200 event at uh, GoGo events at the 200 GeV. So what is actually playing the magic is basically modifying the parameter in this block, in this Trento block. 
So you can see that uh, there's a physics input which you can specify the projectile types and target types as gold. You can also specify other types of nuclei. You need to specify the collision energies, the cross sections, and also some normalization factors, which give you the correct entropy at the initial uh, time of the hydro. Uh, you want to also specify the centrality you would like to simulate here, default is zero to 10%. And if you want to simulate a semi-peripheral collision, say 30 to 40, you just say change this to 30, this to 40 in there, and then you can simulate a different centrality events. So the normalization factor is if parameters uh, for the model to tune. So you need to actually to know what the value is. The cross section is in terms of unit of Fermi square. So it's uh, it's 10 times smaller than the millibomb. So you just divide by the millibomb by 10, you get these uh, cross sections uh, in, this, in this unit. So if you wonder what is the, the normalization factor for different collision energies, if you scroll down to the uh, bottom of the, of the notes, uh, on the side notes sessions. So I list uh, the, the collision systems you can actually try. So there's a gold gold that added three different energies with different normalization factors. So these normalization factors only valid for high uh, for Trento when you connect uh, the Trento initial condition to music. Uh, so you, you can use 5.7 for, for gold gold collisions and then the other two uh, for the other two FC energies. And in Trento, there's available nuclei you can also find in this also list here. So you can have protons, deuterons, copper, xenons, gold, lead, and uranium. So, so those things you can actually try if you are interested in kind of say, uh, say copper gold collisions at the RIC, you can actually try copper gold by changing the projectile name to copper and the target to gold in the, in the Trento sessions. So here, yeah, so if you, if you want to some detailed information in the side, uh, in the side notes uh, sessions in the work. So as an illustration here, I will just do the, the default runs. And then, then if, you want to, if, you, if you want to use a different collision centrality or other systems, you feel free to change it in the XML file. You can also, you can try to basically run a different centrality. So first, uh, so basically I will just uh, use these two commands to run. So first I, was, I will go to the build folder and then I will just uh, copy paste uh, the whole command here. Uh, the second part of the command is just, uh, it, as it's discussed, it just moved all the essential files into this folder so that uh, we won't avoid to overwrite the output file from Hydro uh, when we run this run two, when we want to compare different collisions. So it will just move all the file into this uh, new folder called the run go to go 200, zero to 10%. So now let me switch to my uh, terminals. So, so in my terminal, um, so in the build folders, I will, in the JSK build folders, I will start to run. So I just copy paste the command. So just, just run JSK with this uh, user defined XML for the GoGo 200. After I run this, uh, I will use this collecting script inside this uh, hydro to actually collect results into this folder called run GoGo 0 to 10%. So it will take a while at first if you don't have the, uh, the centrality table generated from Trento, the Trento will actually generate 10,000 minimum biasing events on the fly to actually determine centralities because we specified zero to 10%. Once it generated, it will just generate one initial density file and then it runs through the hydrodynamic simulations. So again, you will see similar kind of evolution messages on your screens if you successfully run these uh, simulations. And then at the end of the simulations, you will have uh, uh, the out outputs in the, in the uh, desired folder. As you can see, this actually ran a bit longer than the last time because last time we ran 50 to 60% uh, centralities uh, at the, for level collisions. So the GoGo central collisions actually run about 13 for me uh, in total time. At the end, uh, you will see that there's a, uh, there's a, uh, there's a output message saying that collect result into this uh, run go go 0 to 10% folders. So if I do list and uh, if I want to just show you where it is, so I want to add some color in the, in the terminal so you can see there's a folder called go go, uh, run go go 200 0 to 10% generated from this command. <laughs> so this 
tell us that we actually successfully run one gold to gold event at rig energies for zero to ten percent centralities. So, um, so in this exercise, we actually want to do some comparisons. So, we want to run a second run uh, to compare uh, collisions at different energies. So here, um, so right now I'm now going back to the slide to the to the notes. So I want to run a second run, say a, zero, a 20 to 30 percent ladder collision at 5.02 dV at the LC energies. So 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 what I want to do is actually want to uh, do the simulation in the build folders and then actually uh, copy paste this command, which I already have the 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 the, the ex existing uh, file there uh, to actually simulate the, the lead, lead events. So I will just copy this command and then actually go, go back to my terminal. Uh, Chun, before you start another, um, yeah. mm -hmm. can you take a look at the, um, the Slack? There's a discussion going yes. on about normalization and, and initial conditions. Uh, I just okay. really want to address a little okay. bit of that. Mm -hmm. And also there are a couple of requests for you to speak louder. <laughs> Okay, uh, so may I just come closer to the mic. Um, so the normalization is the parameter um, that in the initial state model uh, to make sure that we have the correct entropy um, inside the simulations. So in, in the any kind of initial conditions like Trento, um, so the, the overall normalization factor is undefined from not provided by the initial state. So, so you would usually use the, this as a free parameter to make sure that the whole simulations can actually get the final uh, correct charge multiplicities. For example, at go go collisions, you want central collision to have about 800 charge particles. So, so that, that normalization is actually used to tune such that the simulations give you 800 charge particles. At the LC energies, the charge multiplicity is about factor two compared to the RIC energies, and all even more than factor two at the highest uh, 5 TeV. So, so that you will get a, a different normalization factors. And the, usually the, the Trento models will just give you a geometries, uh, which, which is actually correct for the gold gold collisions, but there's no collision energy dependence uh, uh, physics built in the Trento models. So, so all the physics you need to compensate for the growth of the multiplicity productions at the higher energies is controlled um, by these normalization factors. So does that answer the question, I guess? The centrality selections, I guess, is mostly cut on the initial entropy densities instead of cutting on impact parameters. So, so you want to generate, pre-generate say 10,000 events and then use the initial entropy density to cut centralities. Uh, is there any other questions that I want to that I want, then you want me to address? Um, I think there's a question in the in the Zoom, uh, okay. which is: Do you know what the normalization in Trento is for uranium uranium one ninety three GeV system? Oh, so you can use the go go one too. So just uh, 5.7 or 5.9, I don't remember. Yeah, 5.7. So two, 193 is very close to 200. So you can use that as a first guess. So usually what you do is basically use this as a guided numbers. And then you do the whole simulations and look at the charge multiplicities. And then you need to fine tune that number to actually fit to the charge multiplicity of the data. There's one more question from Fernando Yardim. I think it actually might have already been answered mm -hmm. on Slack, but since I started, uh, why in the beginning appears 9,000 events generated, but we were only doing one hydro event? So the 9,000 event is only generated for the initial conditions. Um, so it's a minimum bias selections to actually pre-select events uh, for us in the future that we want to, if we want to simulate a desired centrality event. So if we want to run these 9,000 events, it takes a long time. So, so right now we just as demonstrations, we will just run one event 
in this demo. Um, you can certainly change this n event um, to, to, to be a bigger number, then you will, the simulation will actually run multiple events uh, in, the, in, the hydro, in, the, in the framework. So the 9,000 events is a pre-generated table from initial state, which is a fast, and then, and then we will just use that as a as approximate uh, centrality cut, cut table uh, to, 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 to select uh, the centrality events we want for zero to 10% in the later simulations. So we don't want to do the minimum bias simulations all the time, but just pre-select them in there. So we can just, uh, in, in the following, we can just run directly 500, say 500 zero to 10% event instead of going to a minimum bias sample. Sorry, a follow-up question for me on this, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So, but the, these, this centrality estimation is just coming from the initial part of production, right? It doesn't include the full hydro yes. evolution, mm -hmm. right? So it's just, it's an estimate. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an estimate, yeah, I agree. It's an estimate. So there is entropy production during hydrodynamic simulations, which can make uh, different orders. But uh, initial entropy is a good approximation in most of the cases. If your centrality being is not too narrow, say zero to five or zero to ten percent, uh, ten percent or five percent centrality being uh, using initial entropy density is a good approximation. Okay, so if there's no further question right now, so let me go on to the second run, uh, where we will run 20 to 30 lead lead collision and 5 TeV. So essentially, we'll just change uh, the centrality beings in the Trendle parameter to 2030s, the collision projectile to be lead lead at 5 TeV. And then you can run this script and just copy this uh, to, the, to the terminal. And you can hit run. So again, so since we haven't run that light collision 5 TV before, so Trento will also still generate a minimum bias uh, table for this light light collision 5 TV. And you will still see these event generations for these 10,000 minimum bias events for the collision table. So, so once you generate, then you will start with one hydro run simulation here for 20 to 30 percent light light collisions. So in the end of the simulations, you will see that uh, the results was collect to this run let let 5 TV 30, 20 to 30%. So if I do LS uh, color, so you can see that we have another uh, folder generated uh, for this uh, for this event run, for this one, uh, for one event, the let let collision 20 to 30%. So once you have these two um, uh, folders, we can actually now uh, open the Jupyter notebook and then plot the comparison of the temperature evolution about these two collision systems and see how they differ from each other uh, during hydrodynamic simulations. So, um, so let me come back to the browser again. So you can see, sorry. So, uh, so, so what we want to use is basically a script or notebook called Hydro Evolve Collision System Comparisons .ipy notebook, and there's a corresponding Python uh, script. If you cannot run Jupyter Notebook, so it's the same name with the py in the Python for the Python script. So what you do is you go to the Jupyter Notebook uh, page here and then in the hydro sessions, now we want to select this collision system comparison notebook in this evolve. So if we open this notebook and then we'll go to these new ones and we will do the same thing as we did before. We will execute from the top to 
to button every cell by hit shift enter. So the first line will just set up the, uh, the row and then here we actually uh, specify the run folder to be the event we just run. The first one is the 0 to 10% go go collision 200 GV and the second one is the 20 to 30 percent LED at 5 TV. And then we also add the label uh, to them uh, to, 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 so that uh, we can also put them in the, in the plot. So we, we, we execute this one and then also load the, this cell will actually load the, uh, the, the, the result from hydrodynamic simulations. And then we can plot say the temperature evolutions and compare it between these two. So you can see that here, uh, even though the semi-peripheral LED collisions at the higher energies is a semi-peripheral collision, it still start with the higher temperatures and actually goes uh, and actually expand faster and then just uh, end with a smaller lifetime. And the go-go collisions actually start with a lower temperature and the expansion rate is slower so that you see the temperature drops slower at the lower energy so that the temperature, the, the fireball, entire fireball lives longer uh, and then the temperature drops slower as a function of time. See here, compare GOGO collision at 200 versus that lag collision at 5.02 TeV. So we can also uh, uh, look at the average, the growth of the average velocities. As you can see that at the higher energies, because we have more energy densities in the system, uh, the pressure gradient is actually larger in the lead lag collision compared to GOGO. So we actually have a, a faster, uh, accelerations of the flow velocity. So the average flow velocity actually grows faster as a function of time compared to the lead lag collisions at the, at the wick. So this is also tell us that this is consistent with the temperature evolution that it actually drops faster in the, in the lead lag collision case compared to the go-go case at the, at the wick energies. So we can further look at the evolution of eccentricities. Uh, since the lead ladder collision at the LC is a 20 to 30 percent centralities where there's a well-defined overall geometries. Uh, so, so you see that the large eccentricity at initial time and actually drops as a function of time. For zero to 10 percent, the impact parameter is small, so you get uh, uh, the ellipses, the less deformed elliptics in the overlapping area. So you start with a smaller eccentricity, and it also just drops as a function of time during the evolutions. Last but not least, we can look at the momentum anisotropy. So you can see that uh, both of them start with zero and then the lead lag collisions actually grow faster for the momentum anisotropy compared to the, to the zero to 10% uh, uh, collisions at the weak energies. So these are just uh, illustrations. You can actually run different types of simulation compared to them. So whether these are meaningful comparison is another question, but this just give you an idea uh, how, uh, how you can actually uh, use the hydrodynamic output to study, understand the collision energy dependence or central dependence of the collisions in different types of uh, heavy ion collisions uh, at different energies. So let me stop here, uh, uh, maybe to see whether uh, everybody get these uh, plots uh, from the simulations. Okay. And if there's uh, any questions that uh, I can help answer. Maybe Abidjo, can you generate a poll maybe for- to Okay, so I'm just gonna clear out. Okay, I'm just gonna clear out the poll right now and, uh, and people can, so you can now ask a question. The question is that can people get up to this point? Is that? Yeah, yeah, Hello? yes. So just okay. generate these uh, two centralities and then and then make uh, generate those four plots uh, for the system comparisons. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, I can also answer them. If there are some common questions or physics questions, if you want. Mike and Shinyan, do you guys want to push any of the questions up? 
Uh, I'm trying to address the simple ones in the Slack. Most of the questions so, are being yeah. captured on Slack. We are now at 46 yeses and one no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the output file will be inside the hydro session folder. The output PDF files. Now, 60 yeses and one no. So I think. Mm -hmm. Question that Shinian posted from a student, Kaiser mm -hmm. Shaw. Do you know what the normal oh, the goal is? for some of the uranium one ninety three. Yeah. So normalization you can you can you estimate that with the go go collision two hundred so which is five point seven mm. uh, in the notes. Um, so also he found equal five was k equal point five. Um, the k parameter is the one that I want to avoid to discuss here. Um, the Trento model has also parameters to add the multiplicity fluctuations which will be uh, more physics uh, in grid discussion involved in there, what is multiplicity uh, fluctuations as well as other things. So here I will just uh, stick in the basic, just changing centralities and uh, collision types. I think there will be a talk uh, by Wei Yao in the second week about the ingredients on the, in the Trento model. Uh, about that. I think there will be more physics discussion there. Question from Dan. Mm -hmm. Leonacci, I hope I didn't mm -hmm. put your name too bad. Does the initial radio uh, velocity, uh, radio average velocity of hydro always start to increase from zero, even when using a free streaming pre equilibrium model? So the question, the answer is no. So if you have a free streaming pre equilibrium stage, it doesn't have to start with zero. So you will have some initial flow velocities. Um, so you are likely to be start with some non zero values. Um, whether it increase, uh, I think most of the cases will increase because uh, the hydrodynamic uh, expansion will just use the pressure gradient to push um, the fluid cell to accelerate. So you will always get a larger average radio flow uh, after the hydro, uh, once, once you go into the hydrodynamic phase. Another question, what is the physical significance of normalization factor? So the normalizations controls uh, the total entropy of the collisions. So if you have a collisions at 200 GeV, you want to match the final charge multiplicity to the correct experimental measure values. Since the parameterized initial condition doesn't have physics built in to actually predict the charge, per, charge multiplicity productions. So we use a normalization factors as a pra model parameter to tune the model to match to the experimental measure values. Yeah. Next question from Nura Hussein. Uh, how, to read, how do we read the output file? For example, run gold gold. Oh, so the output file locally yeah, so for there simulation is, uh, study according to our own physics motivation. <laughs> Sorry, I had to finish it. Yeah, so yeah, so uh, there is a detailed discussion uh, explanations about the format of these output files. Um, so you can find in the side notes uh, in the bottom of the of the of the of the handout uh, of the readme files. So so here if you can see that it also tells you what does each column means for for different files. For example, for the eccentricity files, 
um, the format is basically the first column is tau, and then you have the cosine and sine for different order of eccentricities uh, from order one to order six. And then for the moment and isotropy files, you will have the, 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 the ideal part of the T-minute tensor to calculate the moment and isotropy with the shear viscosity, with the force uh, energy moment and tensors, and the eccentricities and some other like uh, factors in this, like the average velocity, gamma, and temp average temperatures. And for the, for the evolution uh, file for the movies, uh, the format is in, in the way written there. So you have this uh, 14, I think 14 numbers, uh, quantities output in these every, for every fluid cells above this temperature above 130 MeV. How to read in, you can actually take a look at the Jupyter notebook. Uh, so how, how this uh, evolution file is read in properly, you can properly read in there using, using the existing um, code there to actually to, to actually read in there for your own uh, purpose. So we had at 65 yeses and one no. So I, I think we can assume. So I guess we can move on to the third task. Okay. Yeah, so the third one actually we want to, so, so now we have some idea about initial conditions. Um, so the third task is trying to understand the role of viscosities in the hydrodynamic simulations, because this is actually the main uh, role of introducing hydrodynamics in the, in the heavy ion simulations. We want to understand, we want to study the transport properties of the coagulum plasma. So especially the role of shear and bulk viscosities in terms of changing the hydrodynamic evolutions. So, so specifying different shear viscosity is rather simple uh, in the simulation. So, so here we'll basically separate the session into, into two of them. So first we'll basically use some simpler values like constant changing some constant for shear viscosity and use and turn, just turn off the bulk viscosity. That will be covered in the session three. And then in section four, we actually introduce the four uh, functional capabilities that you can actually change the temperature dependence for shear and bulk viscosities. So for the section, for the tax three, um, so what we want to do is actually in the, so we want to change these transport properties inside the, the XML files. And these are the actually model parameters for the hydrodynamics. So what you want to focus on is actually the music sessions in the XML files. If I open, if you open an example file, so called the Jetscape user shear and bulk uh, XML files, and it will mostly now not, not, we are not actually um, focus on the initial state was in, in the Trento sessions. We'll move on to actually the music sessions in these XML files. First of all, you can actually just uh, set a constant shear viscosities by, by using this parameter, the shear viscosity eta over S, and you can set the parameters values here with a float number. Um, so the, the, the usual case you can choose is from zero to 0 0.3. So any numbers between zero and 0 0.3 should be uh, physical and also kind of reasonable for the simulations. If you take a too large shear viscosity, say like one or two, then most likely the hydrodynamic simulation will crash because you have too large viscous corrections uh, to the ideal case. So what we can simulate in the hydrodynamic simulations in these uh, second order hydro simulations is uh, the shear viscosity. Uh, if we keep uh, within like 0.3, uh, we are usually in the physical regimes and usually the simulations are physical and, and it can be trusted as a simulations. And then for bulk viscosity at the current uh, test, we just uh, add a switch, which is the temperature dependent bulk viscosity. You can put either zero or one uh, here as an integer uh, to actually turn it on and off, uh, whether you want a bulk, a temperature dependent bulk viscosities in the simulations. Um, so later on, we'll basically lose the, the, the criteria to tell you how you can actually specify more parameters in these sessions to, to give a better, a more uh, generic uh, temperature dependent shear and bulk viscosity. But for now, for these sessions, uh, we just stick to those, uh, those two parameters as a, as a first trial. Um, so, so, so the task is, is uh, similar to the changing the collision system. We basically uh, will actually run, uh, as an example here, I'll just run one with shear viscosity, one with shear and bulk viscosities. 
So that just tell you that the effects of bulk viscosity in terms of the hydrodynamic simulations. Um, here I have a pre-generated XML file for the shear only case, which is this, uh, which is this uh, JScape user shear.xml. And then the one has the bulk viscosity turn on is in this XML file. So as your personal run, you, once, uh, if you don't want to use the default run, you can change the value of shear viscosity in these files to run a different simulation with different viscosities uh, if you are interested in. So as a, in illustrations, I will basically copy, uh, right now I just basically copy this command and into my terminal and then run this JScape simulation with this, with this uh, command. So now I switch to the terminal. So inside a terminal, uh, I will basically paste this uh, command line, uh, this command, and then and just run the simulation with the framework. So this is running a lead -like collision at uh, 2.76 uh, 2.76 TeV for 20 to 30 percent centralities. Uh, we we'll just uh, run the first run with the shear only, uh, with the shear viscosity only. I think the value is 0 0.15 for now. So yeah, it takes about, it runs about 11.1 Fermi for this, uh, for this runs. And after, after the simulation, you can see that the result was collect to this run shear only folder. So if I do LS color, you see that uh, there is a new folder called run shear only folder, which is uh, will store the result for our new run here. So the next I will basically copy paste the second command, which will run the shear and bulk uh, in the terminal. So basically I copy the second command in the, in the lecture notes. So you basically have uh, to run the shear and bulk SML files and then run, save it to a run shear and bulk folder. So this, so the current here. setup, it will run identical. Yeah, so it will run identical events so that you can compare them uh, directly. Yes. Um, Wei Chen asks, if I want to use initial condition from other models, how can I input the initial profile into the music, into the Jetscape frame? Is there an easy way to do that? So you would need to actually uh, build up a customized module uh, for the initial conditions and then pass a pointer uh, for the energy density profile to the hydrodynamic modules. So, so, the, so the connections is already defined between initial state and hydro inside just a framework. You just need to inherit um, the, the, the initial state based modules to actually replace Trento by your own initial state modules. And then provide the same kind of output uh, arrays um, to the JSCA framework so that uh, later on everything can be handled by the framework. Okay, so after the, after the second run with the bulk viscosity, one thing you can notice from the uh, terminal is that the lifetime of the fireball become longer. So if we only use shear viscosity, the lifetime of the fireball for the last output is 11.1. .1. And here, if we would turn on the bulk viscosity, the lifetime becomes 13.2, so it becomes longer. This is because additional bulk viscosity will actually produce extra entropies during the hydrodynamic simulations, which makes the lifetime of the fireball longer in there. And then once you finish the hydrodynamic simulations, the output will be in this uh, run shear and bulk folder. Uh, if you do you know, as color, you'll find that there's a new folder called run shear and bulk folder there. So once we finish these two runs, now we go back to the Jupyter Notebook and we want to visualize the comparison between the two runs and we're trying to see uh, the, the effects of the shear and the bulk viscosities. So we go to, uh, so again, we go to these uh, hydro sessions on the Jupyter Notebook and we want to open a new notebook here. So which is this viscous uh, comparison notebook. There's also the same name, uh, hydro evolved viscous comparison dot py. Uh, if you don't have the the, the, the Jupyter notebook uh, uh, open, so if you have that, you can open that notebook by click on that, 
So once you have that, it's the same as the before. You just uh, go through every execute every flu every every code cells. So you just go one by one. So here we just instead of reading the the, the initial uh, folders as go go the lat lat and the previous examples, now we're reading this uh, the newly generated events with run share only and the run share block folders. I also add some nice uh, labels for my run so that I know which uh, sets of the simulation is with uh, what type of uh, transport coefficients. So now we can read in the files and then we can actually make the plot, for example, for the, for the evolution of the temperature profiles. So now you can see that at the early time uh, for the, these two runs, it actually start with the same temperature because we actually use a fixed seed to simulate our simulations on purpose so that the two runs actually run with the same initial conditions, but just different transport coefficients. One just with shear viscosity 0.15, and the other is 0.15 for shear viscosity and also a temperature dependent bulk viscosity. So the temperature bulk viscosity here is only peak at 180, where you have a large bulk viscosity peak at there. So you can see that early time at the high temperatures, there's no much difference between these two runs. Only when you have every temperature around 120, 80 MeV, uh, when you have the, the rise of bulk viscosities, then you see that the waste bulk viscosity line actually decreases slower as a fun, uh, the temperature evolution decreases slower than the, than the pure shear, shear only case. So that the, the, the bulk viscosity actually generates some extra um, entropies and also slow down the expansions so that the, the temperature evolution becomes slow and live longer for the, for the, for the shear and bulk simulations. And then we can also at the same time look at the average evolution of the average velocities. And you can see that also clearly see that uh, with the bulk viscosity, the, the average flow velocity becomes smaller than the pure shear case. So that you can see that the effect of bulk viscosity in the simulations is actually reduced the average radial flow which makes sense because the bulk viscosity acts as a resistance to the local radial expansion. So it actually will reduce the actual radial flow development during the hydrodynamic simulations. And the slower expansions uh, in these uh, bulk simulations also slow down the temperature evolutions in the upper panel. So these two are actually are also consistent with each other so that you have a slower temperature, uh, you have a slower expansion of the fireballs, which also slow down the drops of the temperatures in the evolutions. And eventually the fireball actually also lives longer due to, uh, to just due to that and also due to the fact that there's actual entropy productions in the simulations. So you can also move on to the, to the evolution of the eccentricities. So you can see that also because with the bulk viscosity, the fireball expands slower. So the, even the shape also evolves slower. So you can see that the, the drops of the spatial eccentricities is actually slower than the case with sheer pure shear viscosities, so that you can get the slower drops of eccentricity there uh, in the, in the, with the bulk viscosity evolutions. And last but not least, you can also, we can also look at the development of the momentum and isotropy, which is related to V2. So you can see that for the shear only case, actually uh, it has some mm, kind of ripple here, which is because of the initial state fluctuations, the angle or the phase of these actually rotate uh, somewhat by here. But in the later stage where the flow is uh, mostly developed, you can see that it's just smoothly increased as a function of the buffer time. But as you can see with the bulk viscosity included in the simulations, you get, get a lower uh, development of the lower value of this moment and isotropy, which means that the V2 uh, generated from this event which actually be lower than the pure shear case. So that means that the bulk viscosity not only reduced the radial flow expansions in the fireball it also reduced uh, the development of the elliptic flow in the, in the simulations. So that you can also see from these uh, dynamical uh, evolution variables. So let me stop here so that uh, I'll just give you a few minutes uh, about uh, see whether you have generated these four profiles uh, and then see the comparison between the shear and bulk viscosity. We can have a new poll and then you can indicate once you finish this uh, we can then move on to the section four when you can have uh, freedom to change a uh, different temperature and bulk, uh, temperature dependency and bulk viscosities. And in the meantime, I can also take some questions uh, on the Slack uh, if there are some common questions.
So there's a question, so why there's a bump in the three Fermi for the eight hour, for the moment anisotropy. So that's mostly because of the even by even fluctuations, because we only plot the, the magnitude of the moment anisotropy. Um, so um, there could be some phase uh, change in these rotations on this, uh, on, this, uh, mag uh, on, this, uh, on this magnitude so that we get this bump due to some event by event fluctuation in the initial states. So that the angle of these guys can actually rotate from one to the other. So you get some of these kind of weird structures in these event by event simulations. So when the flow is fully developed, you can see just a smooth uh, development of the moment anisotropies due to the overall geometries. At the early times, the initial individual hotspot can, can actually be more effective to generate these uh, uh, bump structures in there. Could you comment? Could you comment on the conservation conserve charges? So, so right now, yes. Uh, so for these simulations, we use zero baryon density. So, so the conserve charge for the baryon current is zero in the simulations. So the Trento initial conditions only right now provide us with energy densities, not with the initial baryon densities. Also in the third dimensions. So, so we will have uh, basically run with zero baryon densities. In the future, uh, so if we incorporate some other initial conditions which can provide us with a baryon density profile, uh, the hydrodynamic can also simulate with a baryon density current. And it actually comes out, and also you can add the diffusion, which is the viscous correction to that. So, um, so far only 19 yeses. Mm -hmm. So I think this is taking some time. Of course, the moment I said that, people start clicking yes. Mm -hmm. Now we're at 52 yeses and one no. I'm still rising. There will be, is there any, maybe, yeah. So I think I see there are 64, yeah. which is one. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe is there, before we move on, is there any physical questions you want to, you want me to answer? Like physics question in terms of simulation. I think simulation is pretty much, you get the, you get at least the default set settings. Um, So we are still holding at 64 yeses and one no. Could the people who are still not voting, uh, yes, if, if there's a, if you're yeah. you know, facing yeah. issues, could you post them in the Slack? Labels. So yeah, so for the A over S, so in my simulation as examples, uh, I basically uh, set in the XML, the A of S to be 0.15. Um, so that's why I labeled the curve as 0.15. So for the, for the dash curve, you should really see A of S is constant plus a different uh, bulk viscosity, temperature dependent bulk viscosities. So the label could be a little bit confusing in the bulk, uh, in the bulk cases. So initial energy density is not saved to a file. This is the option. Um, so the Trento uh, initial energy density profile, I'm not sure there's this options in the framework that you can save to a file right now. Um, 
yeah, that I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, I think we can move on uh, to the to the to the last one. Um, so, right. so, so the last I one will, is basically. I will clear this out, right? Yeah. I mean to clear mm -hmm. this, yes. clear out mm -hmm. the poll. Okay. Yeah, you can clear out it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, so for the last sessions, we want to do temperature dependent uh, shear and bulk viscosity. So you see that we go to this uh, ultimate instinct mode. So, so this is kind of the ultimate things you would like to do as a user. Um, you would interested in different uh, types of temperature dependent viscosity for shear and bulk viscosities. So here, um, so in the in the hydro and the jetscape, we actually uh, give the user some freedom to actually implement a different uh, temperature dependent shear viscosity and bulk viscosity using the following parameters. So we use four parameters to categorize the temperature dependent for shear viscosities, which is showing, sorry, did you see my, you still see my browser, right? I still, I forgot which one I'm sharing. We're seeing your browser so let me just make sure. uh, with the yes, formula for eta yeah. over mm -hmm. S expanded as a function of yes. temperature. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, so this is the temperature dependence we actually code in in the hydro um, so that uh, the user can, can just change the value of this A low, which is the slope at the low uh, side of the temperature, uh, the value of the eta of S at some kink, and then some A high, which is a slope at the high temperature side uh, and also the, the kink uh, temperature in there. So the actual shape of the viscosity is actually plot in this plot. So you can have the A, slow, a low slope control the lower temperature uh, slope here, and then the A high control the high temperature end of the shear viscosity at here. And you can specify a parameter T eta to determine where the kink will be, and also what value of the A, uh, a of S at the kink here. So these four parameters give you a bilinear, uh, uh, bisection linear functions for this uh, A double S as a function of temperature. And this is controlled by these four parameter here. And similarly, uh, you can actually use four parameters to control the temperature dependence of the bulk viscosities. Um, so here we choose a different, slight different form from the shear viscosity because bulk viscosity is proportional to the breaking of the conformal symmetries in the, uh, in this, in the, in the QCD theory. So we would express some kind of peak structure at some temperatures with certain width of the peak. So here we basically introduce a Lorentzian form of the of the of the of the bulk viscosity temperature dependence for the bulk viscosity. Uh, the detail equations is is explained here, and the shape is basically look like that. So we have a a peak position for the bulk viscosities, and then the peak values you can specify and the widths, which specify how large the, the bulk peak will be, and some asymmetric parameters lambda, which give you asymmetry, which can int introduce asymmetries between the peak width, between lower than the peak and the uh, uh, higher than, sorry, higher, higher than the temperature, temperature higher than the peak. So, so with these four parameters, you can actually hum the shape of this bulk viscosity in a large degree in to include a large uh, class of the temperature dependent bulk viscosities in the simulations. So in order to actually turn on these, uh, these tools, you need to specify first the temperature dependent shear viscosity ratio parameter to be three in the, in, the, in the XML files, and also the temperature dependent bulk viscosity parameter to be three in the XML file. So one of the examples is showing here, um, so that if you open, the XML file called hydro session jet user temperature dependent viscosity XML. So you will find that uh, in, the, in the session here, we will have a lot more parameters in these music sessions, which help us to parameterize uh, the shape of temperature dependent shear and temperature dependent bulk viscosities. So you first need to make sure that you have this temperature, temperature dependent shear to S ratio set to three and also temperature dependent bulk rate of viscosity set to three. And then it follows four parameters as we just discussed to actually tune uh, different parameterization of the bulk viscosity there. 
we can first also include a, a switch to include all the second order turns in the hydrodynamic simulations. You can also turn on and off these parameters by zero and one to turn, turn them on and off and you see whether they play a role in the hydrodynamic simulations in the, in the simulation here. So these are the parameters a user can specify in the, in the, in the simulations to, to actually try different temperature dependent shear and bulk viscosities. So of course, there's already eight parameters for you to use. So, so how to get optimized value is the questions for the Bayesian analysis in the next week. So John Fonswa will tell you how actually inside JSCape we can actually systematic tune so many parameters in the simultaneous way to get a overall ultimate fit to the, to the experimental data. So, but at this, uh, at this, in these uh, sessions, you can basically feel free to try different values of, of these parameters in a physical reasonable range uh, so that the, the, you don't crush the hydro, so that you don't take too large shear viscosity uh, values or too large bulk viscosity value in somewhere. But uh, if you set some reasonable values, the hydrodynamic simulation will actually run with the desired temperature and dependent shear and bulk viscosity you input in here. So in order to run these simulations, it's rather simple. So you can modify these parameters in the XML files the way you want. And then you can actually just run uh, these scripts and just run these scripts on the shells uh, in, in, your, in your command line. And you will actually run JSCAP with desired uh, input of temperature dependent shear and bulk viscosities in there. So now let me switch to the terminals to show you the examples. So in the, in the examples, we just, uh, we just copy paste. So maybe I just uh, modified it a bit instead of the default ones. So if I open the hydro sessions, to user temperature XML files. So here, <clears throat> so I have the, the four parameters here to show that uh, these are temperature dependent shear viscosity and there are four parameters here to show the temperature bulk viscosities. So for example, I want to have the kink of the shear viscosity to be around 180 MeV or 0.18 GeV. And I want the slope to be negative 0.1 so that uh, I actually have a rising. Uh, here, if I use a positive slope uh, in the lower temperatures, I will have a decreasing A of S as go to lower temperatures. So I want a negative slope for the low temperatures. And then I have a positive slope at the high temperatures also indicate the A of S also increase the high temperature. And then I want to set the kink value to be small, the, the one or near one over four pi, which is okay. Then for the bulk viscosity, I want to set the peak to be 0.1, maybe the peak around 0 0.16 GeVs. The width is 0.1. I don't want to introduce some uh, asymmetries in there. So I will just leave that uh, parameters at this as I want to set up in this way. So I can basically, uh, basically run this, sorry. Uh, I'll just copy paste. Yeah, so I just now run these simulations with this input and then move it into this new folder called run temperature dependent viscosity folder. So I will run the same simulation as the viscosity exercise we did before. We we'll run the same events, that at events at 20 to 30 percent centralities at 2.76 TV. So the same events as before but with the temperature dependent viscosities that we now use for both shear and bulk viscosities. So we'll now wait for it to finish and then make the plots uh, compare uh, with, uh, make the plots for, this, uh, for these simulations. So it's finished, so it will be actually moved into this uh, run temp, uh, temperature dependent viscosity folder. So now we can actually uh, actually switch to the, to the browser um, to actually uh, make comparison with them. So first of all, uh, I don't have, uh, I only have prepared a notebook that uh, give you the, the temperature evolutions as a movie. So we'll first look at this and then before we compare with the other viscosity case. So basically we can actually look at the evolutions when you have uh, of the profile when you have to introduce the temperature dependent shear and bulk viscosities. So we open this uh, hydro movie temp dependent viscosity profile uh, notebook 
and we can execute the, the cells one by one as usual. So now we're actually just reading the profile from this folder. So it take a little bit while because it actually take a long, a little bit. Uh, it, so you see that it takes about uh, 11, that's so a 116 time frame, And then the resolution here is actually slightly better than, than before. So we have 0.4 in the XDY in this movie file. So we get the fine, a little bit finer resolutions in this output uh, with these temperature dependent shear viscosities. So again, so similarly, we can plot the shape of initial temperature distribution just from Trento at the tau equal 0.5. You look at that, this is about 20 to 30%. So you see the remnant almond shape of the overlapping area. And you have some hot spots in the middle of the individual because these individual nucleon fluctuations in the initial conditions. Again, you can generate some temperature evolutions um, as a function of tau. And in the transverse plane, so you can see that it initially is hot in the in the transverse plane, and then just gradually go to some lower temperature profile, uh, lower temperature regions in the later time. So then we can actually now look at the movies. So in the movies, you can see that uh, gradually the profile actually evolves as a function of time, uh, from hot temperatures to the lower temperatures. Mm. As, as things evolve, so you can see just the color contour just evolve from the hot temperature to lower temperature. And also the shape changes as, as it goes on. So all, all the fluids are above 130 MeV in this movie. So later on, you can also do the fancy one, which you can add the flow velocities together with the, the, together with the median so that you can also see how the flow velocity arrows grows as a function of time uh, in, this, in these heavy ion collisions. So you can see that the arrow is, seems to be a little bit longer in the horizontal directions than the vertical directions, which indicate radial flow, also elliptic flow in these cases. And in the later time, you see that about five Fermi's, the fireball is almost round, almost homogeneous, like a very smooth. The initial state, even by the fluctuations, almost wash out about at around five Fermi. And you have just a very kind of smooth Gaussian-like blob evolving in the, in the evolutions. So I will stop here for a while for you to play around uh, with, this, uh, with this, uh, pra these parameters. Uh, you can actually uh, simulate and then, and then just generate evolutions with those, with those setup. You can also just uh, add in this into the comparison with the temperature evolutions and et cetera with your previous runs so that you can get the idea like if I change it, introduce some temperature dependency and bulk viscosity, what do I change the temperature evolutions as well as radio flow flux, uh, radio developments in here. So if you are okay, uh, so I think I will stop here till 1045 uh, for you to play around. Uh, a little bit with your own parameterizations on, on the choice of shear and bulk viscosities. And then the last, thing, last 15 minutes, I will basically go through the bonus sections where you can connect to a particle, uh, particle Cooper Fry particleization module to actually generate particles and spectrums for pions and the V2s. So during the times uh, I can, if there's any questions uh, I can answer on the Slack, I can answer it now till 1045. Uh, Chun, yes. hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm just wondering if we could schedule yes. a, a, a break, a, a short break between your session and Dima's session, you know, to let people oh, sort of okay. get up uh, and walk around a little bit. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's fine. I, I can stop at 10.55. I think 10 minutes may be enough uh, for, for the demonstration of the bonus point. Yeah. Okay. Okay, there's a slide, there's a pause, seek a replay. So, um, so in the option, um, there's a repeat. You see there's a repeat uh, option here, uh, which is set to false right now. If you set to true, it will basically loop over the animations uh, uh, like uh, from, from, the, from the top once it's finished. Um, and also you can basically use the save, animation save uh, command in the last line, which is currently commented out. 
you can uncomment this and then generate the MP4 files into a file and then you can use it uh, from your local, you can play around, you can play it in your, in your local machine, in your local laptop, uh, just uh, MP4 files. You can also incorporate those uh, in your future uh, talk uh, in there uh, if you want uh, to illustrate some dynamical evolutions. So yeah, so the, the trick is then that uh, I'm not a very good artist, so you can choose your favorite color map inside this uh, Jupyter Notebook or using other kind of software you, 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 are, you, are, you are familiar with, like Paraview, for example, uh, to generate those movies using these evolution files. Uh, so, 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 the, so the real, the real kind of thing for you is actually pick your favorite color map scheme and then generate the awesome uh, animations uh, for for the for the for your talk for your future talk or just illustration about uh, how hydrodynamics evolves uh, in heavy ion collisions. There's a question about how to control equation of state. So there's a parameters. Uh, in the files, which which you can you can switch one equation state from the other, uh, but for demonstration purpose, I didn't mention it. Uh, it should be you can take a look at the manual for music, and also for Jetscape to see how you can switch from one equation state to the other. Yeah, so there's a, there's a curiosity question is why the, the parameter need to be set to three to introduce the temperature dependent shear viscosities? Because uh, two is also another option that I didn't mention, which is another parameterization uh, inside, uh, inside the framework uh, with a different, with a social, with a different parameter sets. So, so yeah, there are two or three different temperature parameterization functional form we introduce inside the music and Jetscape. Uh, to 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 account for different needs, so 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 for three is the most generic one uh, with four parameters, and the second option is some kind of in, internal one that has a few parameters in there. Yeah, there's an error you may see from the FFMP G is not available. Uh, this is most likely you're running the Jupyter Notebook outside your Docker container, uh, and you don't have the FFMP G installed on your local machines. Uh, in that case, you can actually output to a GIF, a GIF file instead of MP4, and you don't you don't uh, you don't specify the, the 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 rates, the FPS in here, and you can still output the file in there without FFMP G. Is, uh, how does the movie, how to see the movie without the Jupyter Notebook? So if you run the Python scripts, there will be output file called something something dot mp4 uh, in your hydro session folders. You can just open that with your uh, video player to, to see the movies. And I have a question for the PP multiplicity. Yeah, so, so yeah, you can send me emails about the PP multiplicities. I can answer your specific questions by email. Yeah. So so yeah. So so the so the so the gen generating animations is taking quite a long time uh, for the Python scripts. So so for the demos, I'm using a, a machine with ten or with twelve CPU threads <laughs> uh, laptop. So basically, you see it is faster. So if you use less CPU cores, it may take a longer time to generate these animations. So 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 it's good practice to first make sure using a lower resolution that your, your setting up for the animation is always uh, is automated tuned before you generate the final versions that which take a longer time 
so that you don't have to iterate uh, during uh, through a longer period of times doing simulations. So that's why I mostly introduced this n skip equals to two so that the demonstrations uh, runs much faster. And then if you want the production run with high resolutions, you can set to be the high resolution, take a longer time to just make sure it run once to, to generate those uh, uh, animations you want. Okay, and now it's 10.44. Let me go to the bonus session. Uh, which which I think is interesting to, to actually getting some physics uh, results out to compare with the data. So, so far we discussed is all just about the uh, exercise on the hydrodynamic variables in terms of flow velocity and the shape of eccentricities, etc. But in the experiments, we finally described the particle result. We actually measure particles. So we want to particleize these fluid cells through Cooper Fry formula and then use and basically analyze them to, as the way the experimentalists do. So this uh, comes to um, the, the, the bonus sessions um, in the, let me make sure I'm sharing the Chrome. So, so uh, let me just talk about the bonus session, session five, which is produce hadrons from hydrodynamic simulations. So in this case, uh, in addition to basically adding the hydrodynamic modules, we also need to add the particleization modules, which is indicated in the XML file here. I just uh, indicate this is a soft particleizations modules, and then we use a specific module which is called ISS, which is a code package I developed to basically generate particle samples through the Cooper Phi formula. So right now you don't actually need to specify uh, any, modify any parameter in there, you can use the default to generate particle samples. So that's why we only have just the module name here, and that's enough for our purpose to generate particles. And also in this case, we want to run not just one event, because as you know, uh, there is finite number of particles in one event, so we cannot get enough statistics, but also it takes too long to generate those uh, multiple events. So right now as a demonstration purpose, I generate 10 events in these XML files. And also I use a trick so that I use this uh, reuse hydro to be true so that I only want the framework to run one hydro simulations, but over them for the hypersurface 10 times to generate 10 individual uh, hydronic events uh, in the experiments. Of course, these 10 events are coming from the same hydro events. Um, so they cannot be understand as the real collision, real event by event heavy ion collisions. But if you do this over example, they actually help us to increase statistics when we actually analyze particle spectrums and well as anisotropic flow coefficients. In the real case, we want to like to run is run multiple hydro events, say on the order of a few hundred to a thousand events for per centrally beings, and turn on the over example uh, switch to be about thousand or ten thousand um, uh, events to actually manage to get enough events to 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 can to be sufficient with the comparable with experimental data. So as the, uh, as the illustration here, I just run 10 events as uh, examples here. So what you want to do is basically run Jetscape with the XML files is called Jetscape user music and ISS. Using this uh, file, we'll basically just run hydro and we'll run the hydronic, uh, or we'll run the uh, particleization modules after the, after the hydrodynamic simulations. So now I just copied this command into my command line. And then I'll just show you terminal how this looks like. So inside the just get build folder. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry from me, Mike. Hi. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. in doing this oversampling, which I'm not saying is bad, uh, what do you do with the error bars, right? Because these oversampled effects events are correlated. So I can't compute yes, an yes. error bar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, 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 so usually the error, bar, the error bar is not calculated with the oversample events. However, we're only counting for the, for the, the real hydrodynamic events you run. So the oversample events just only serve the purpose that you can get a higher resolutions uh, for the QM vectors as well as uh, as, 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 as a correlation functions to actually boost, to, to help with the numerical simulation to boost the accuracy. Uh, in terms of in terms of getting statistics, uh, but the actual error bar is actually calculated using using the real hydro events. Good, good. Just checking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so now I just 
uh, copy paste um, the command to run the hydro with uh, particle samplers. So now you see that uh, first uh, JetScape, uh, as usual, will just run uh, hydrodynamic simulations at first to generate the hypersurface or the fluid cells at the switching surface around 150 MeV that we will actually do the cuprified particleizations. So this run will actually run, it's almost finished. I think it's about uh, 10, more than 10 Fermi should be finished soon. So right after the collision, you will see that there's an additional output uh, from the screens, which is uh, from coming from the sampling uh, procedures. So you will see that uh, just, uh, it will just keep running for 10 times uh, to generate all the 10, 10 events in the, in the hydrodynamic simulator, uh, the 10, 10 hydronic events uh, from the same hydrodynamic hypersurface. So if you now list the directories, what output in addition to the previous events is that they will output a file that also we discussed uh, in, on Tuesday and also Monday that the, the JetScape uh, will actually output the particles into these tests underscore out dot that files. So right now I'm actually using the ASCII format. So basically our, this, this file is a, is a text file. So I can parse this uh, file to only get the, to get the only uh, final state particles, use these uh, final state hadron uh, executables inside the JetScape. And then I just specify the test.out name as the input file. And then out, my output file is this hadron list.dat in there. So if I run this uh, uh, function now, you can see that it actually start to read in the, the test uh, test out dot that files and tell me that there are ten events. So it's current events event ID go from zero to nine. So there are ten events in there, and there are about seven thousand hundred seven thousand particles hadrons in this event because we are sampling uh, hadrons in a unit uh, in a rapidity window from minus five to five. So for this uh, for these uh, collisions, which is a uh, that collisions at twenty to thirty percent, twenty to thirty percent centrality at the RC energies, um, you get about seven hundred twenty particles per unit of rapidities. So these cover about ten units of rapidities of particles uh, in particle range. So you get about like seven thousand particles there, and then the out the final output file is in this uh, hadronic list hadron list dot that files. So that is the file that contain the momentum information of, of all the particles. If I open this file, you can see that it has these headers, which is the same as the you encountered in the in the in the Tuesdays or Mondays uh, class. So this number is the so this the, the first number is the event plane angle here right now just zero, and then there are these is particle numbers and there's some information about the header about the the meaning about all these lines. So I assume that you already know uh, most of the momentum information from, this, uh, from these files, uh, from the previous exercise. So uh, as now, I basically just have a script to basically read in this uh, file, actually to uh, calculate the particle spectrums and, and the V2 from these files. So this is actually, um, uh, let me switch now to the, to the, to the, to the browser so that uh, so this is actually uh, in the notes that this says this actually is in this analyzed particle spectrum and vn.ipy notebook. Also, if you don't have the Jupyter notebook, you can use the same Python script to generate the plots in there. So now we actually go to the, go to the last notebook, which is the analyzed particle spectrum and vns. If we click on that and open that, the same as, the same as before, so it just goes through the setup stage. Yeah, I just wrote a simple histogram functions to help me to do the histogram in this Python. And then just uh, here, I basically reading this hadron list uh, uh, files from my, uh, from my build folder where I generate them. So in the end, it will just tell me that, okay, if I successfully reading, it just tell me that I totally read in 10 events uh, using this loop. And then basically I can start to bring uh, the particles into, into uh, particle spectrum and also calculate their V2. So here I just uh, generate this uh, histogram for the PT spectra and the real part and imaginary part of the V2 because there are 10 events. So I can calculate the, the both real and imaginary part and both of them are non-zero. So after some interpolations, I can basically plot the particle spectrums, say for pions. So this is the pion spectrums I got from these 10 events. As you can see that uh, we get some good statistics for the pion spectra at the low PT 
uh, below 1.5 GeV, so you see that the curve is almost like exponentials in the semi-log uh, plot. So the y-axis is in the log scales. So you can see that it's almost uh, log, log uh, uh, exponential spectrums. And we start to lose uh, statistics above 1.5 GeV because we have very few particles there. So if we only generate 10 events, there's not enough particles to fill up the histogram here. But if we generate more events, they will start to fill up the, the, the spectrums in the high P detail. Um, so here, I forgot to explain a little bit, uh, just here in the analysis script, I basically pick on, so I think I pick on the pions. Uh, yeah, I should, yeah, so, so in here, I basically pick the PID, so I only, not, they didn't look at all the charge particles, but only look at charge pions, say pi plus, using the PID numbers. And also I specify the repeated window between minus one and one, so that I didn't use the full 7,000 particles inside the samples, but just using the pi plus samples within these central repeated regions to generate the spectrums. So if you want to do a different rapidity cut or different particles, you can specify in these uh, simple scripts uh, to, to, to do your exercise to get say protons or other things. And then the, the next one is just plotting V2. As you can see that the V2 plot here as a function of PT is very jaggy. And this is most because we are still lacking statistics. This tell you that 10 hydro events, or one hydro event with 10 over sample is way not enough to generate a meaningful V2 plot here. So, so you need the more, much more statistics to generate a meaningful V2 here. So, which what takes a long time to run. So I didn't explain, I didn't show you any in the, in the examples, but if you are curious, uh, to generate a real V2 plot, uh, you need to actually uh, change the unsample, uh, unsample parameter here. So n events parameter to be a larger number, preferably about uh, 500 to 1,000 to actually give you some statistical significant, um, significant V2 signals from these hydro event. Let's just be, make sure that uh, it takes a while to generate them. So before you start the runs, you just uh, just be prepared that it will take a reason, quite a bit of time to generate them on your laptop. So that's the bonus sessions. <clears throat> Essentially, just show you a walk uh, to, 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 to see how uh, basically you can actually generate particle spectra in the end. And then these actually can be compared uh, with the extra experimental data. So I basically will stop here. Um, so I guess if you don't have questions, you can take a five minutes break. Uh, if you have questions, I can keep answering them until the my session begins. So is there any questions uh, the chair want me to answer? I'm going to defer to Mike and Shinyan. Do any questions they want to bring up? Not, uh, not in the Zoom chat. No. Technical stuff. Yeah, probably. You are still busy. Most of them are still busy on the simulation, maybe. But anyway, so if you are curious or have any question, you can post on Zoom. Uh, post on Slack anytime. I can I can help you to answer them even offline. No, ask a loaded question. <laughs> so is it possible for the spectra that's shown here to go negative at high PT? Uh, no, so that's uh, all just, this is just histogram. So it's all just, you just, the lowest value will be zero. And also the particle <coughs> sample are required to be sample positive particle. So you won't get the negative particle but this, this, is, here. Mm -hmm. this is coded in, right? Any Anytime this goes negative, it's set to zero. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, uh, this is, a, it, it, you have this limited statistic because only you only do monocolor sampling on the hypersurface, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, if, so, you, so if you do Cooper-Fry formula, if you do Cooper-Fry formula, not do monocolor sampling, but instead do just you know mm -hmm. calculate spectrum or yeah. they do mm -hmm. the, uh, integration, then mm -hmm. you don't have this problem. 
Right, right. So you have then you have infinite statistics, but that takes a long time. So it's a trade-off whether uh, I know that uh, that there's also GPU version of the Cooper Fry calculations that can actually speed up the simulations. Uh, but usually, if you just want to run on your simple PC with one CPU cores, uh, calculating say 200, 300 species of particles using Cooper Fry formula takes a long time and uh, Monte Carlo samplers uh, takes a smaller time to generate actual samples. Uh, but still, you need to generate more of them, like a thousand of them to, 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 get, to get meaningful statistics in there. And also, I think for experimentalists, dealing with particles is much easier than dealing with continuum uh, distributions. So, so I think to generate a particle from them is actually more friendly to the experimentalists uh, compared to theorists. Yeah, additionally, if you need to feed to the late time uh, cascade code, it's better to have actual. Yeah, so yeah, there's a late time hadronic transport, which also taking the particle sample, particle samples. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I think it's now it's 11, so I don't want to take any time from the email sessions. I guess, yeah, so thank you for joining and uh, practice out this hand on session with me. Today and if you have further questions, please post on the Slack channel. I will help you to figure them out, and then I can. I think we can switch to demo sessions for now. Okay. Thank you, Chun. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen and your um, and your camera. <clears throat> uh, Dima, are you ready to go? Okay, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes, and I see you. And uh, okay. I've I've made um, Anna Schaefer and Justin Mo are your are your TAs. I've also made them co-hosts. Okay. And uh, uh, yes, do we start? Um, I I just but are, are you ready? Yes. Yes. Okay, so we are now moving on from the hydro session to the cascade uh, hands-on session. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, when now when you ask questions on this session to use the other channel, the bulk Olinichenko. And once again, even though we only meet for three hours a day, you know that you can keep asking questions on the Slack channels. Um, and people will try to get to them, uh, you know, maybe not immediately, but eventually. Okay, so uh, take it away, Dima. Okay, I hope that everybody is still alive and able to think. So let's, uh, let's finish the hydro session with your mind and go to the hadronic afterburner session, which is a smash hands-on session. Um, there was a lecture about smash yesterday. Now we are just doing hands-on from the very beginning. Uh, and what we want to do is basically use smash as a hadronic afterburner. We are going to do that decoupled from the Jetscape. You can do it in Jetscape, but uh, it is interesting to use it decoupled from the Jetscape because anyways, it's the last stage. Uh, and in this way, you can see more about Smash configuration. And then we are just going to generate some root output of particles and collisions happening in Smash, uh, analyze them, and in the end, by analyzing, we want to learn something about chemical and kinetic result. And as a bonus, if we have time, probably we don't have time, so maybe this is going to be a homework. Um, generate some visual output and look at nice, cute visualizations of collisions using Smash. To begin with, let's check that we have all the school prerequisites uh, installed. And probably you should have them installed because, well, <laughs> you were working already with the Hydro session. But Let's make sure that Docker is working. And uh, it is helpful for some exercises to have root outside of Docker also working. One really important thing, I want you to track your progress via the table. Uh, probably you cannot click this link, like I can click it, but you can find the link uh, on the GitHub in these instructions. So add yourself to this uh, Google table and track your progress. In this way, I can see how far you reached 
where you are stuck and I can see myself some statistics of what's going on. Also, I can see who is actively participating. So it is, it is really imperative to add yourself to this table and track your progress. Um, okay, at this point, yeah, just add yourself to the table, take 30 seconds to do this couple of clicks uh, and I will just watch at the table. Uh, oh yeah, that's a really good idea. Let me put the link. Uh, copy the link and put it to the Slack channel. Let me click on it and make sure it's the right one. Okay, it's taking ages to open, but it is opening. Okay, and I see some people adding themselves here. Oh, and some people already even completed a lot of sections. Well done, well done. Mm. Okay, so I see that people are adding to the table. The table is accessible. Mm. Now let's go back to the exercises. Wait a moment, how do I open it back? Wait, okay. Uh, if you don't have root installed outside of the Docker environment, it's also okay. There are all the alternative instructions for this case, so you don't need to worry. But it's just nice have nice to have root because then you can use this nice Visual T browser to visualize results. So let's go. Uh, the first part that we want to do is to get Smash ready, um, get into the Docker environment as you were getting before this docker start minus AI my Jetscape, go specifically to the external packages of Jetscape, um, not to the Jetscape build folder, not to somewhere else. So specifically to this. Okay, maybe if you're already in the Jetscape docker environment, then you don't need this Jetscape docker in the beginning, you just have to go to Jetscape external packages. And execute smash get smash dot sh. And you should see something compiling, something building, something going on. And I guess I will have to wait for a few seconds until you execute it. And when you are done it, then try to run Smash. 